national women's organization that offers services, networking, fellowship, diversity, leadership, advancement, and education around the world. Like, geez, you guys do quite a bit. That is quite the list. We have some representatives here today that are going to offer us that presentation from the Zonta Club. And allow me to first introduce the president of the Zonta Club of Granton Paladin, Carolyn Sheehan.
bring their children with them. They can begin to talk about what their experience is uh, and access the services that they need to help and support them. And one of the things I know unequivocally is that when women come to us for the first time, they feel very alone, are isolated and afraid. And when they know that it's not just service providers that are there for them, but they know that there are people in their community that care and want to give and support them, it goes a long way for women to feel connected and empowered to do what they need to do to ensure their safety and the safety of their children. So I just want you to know, uh, all of the, the Zonta members, that uh, the dollars go a long way to help us in the work that we do, but what goes even further is the care and the commitment that you have to women. And I would just like to also say that for any of you who want to find a way to give back, uh, to give, to be a part of the movement, I think Zonta is a great organization to join to make that difference in, in our community. So please accept my heartfelt thanks for the ways that you support the work of all of our organizations, all 18 of us, uh, but more importantly, all the ways that you help the women who come to us it matters when a woman knows that another woman has given because she cares. Thank you so very much. And as I well, Anna, for everything that you guys do, obviously doing fantastic work in uh, the city. I'd now like to introduce Rachel Kim from the Z Club.
obstacles come in many forms, and sometimes the most challenging are simply the people who perpetuate this negative stigma that surrounds feminism. But I can speak on behalf of all Zen clubs here today. We have not been deterred by these obstacles. Instead, they have fueled our resilience and commitment to the cause. Thank you, everyone. such as our tactical unit, 
or canine or intelligence bureau, but because of the male pre because of male presence in these units. But by creating an encouraging atmosphere, we find that more females are applying to these positions. And again, it is through the uh, having allies for the male for allies. When we look at outwardly facing as an organization, again, it was spoken to earlier, the importance for us, we're looking and working with our communities in collaboration to look at strategies to eliminate intimate partner violence, sex assault, and human trafficking. We know that the victim of these crimes are most likely to be women. Statistically, we know that intimate partner violence is the number one call for service within the village of homeless. We have officers that are dedicated to working towards eliminating this. But even more so than enforcement, one of the things we think that's really, really very important is we work with our community partners and victims and survivors so that we can receive and utilize a wraparound approach to support women who enter and encounter these positions. I can say to you today, as a woman of color, I was the first female black officer within the Peel Regional Police. Today I stand before you, I'm the highest ranking black female officer in Canada, and now
that's called SAIL, that is um, educating the girls and the boys in the school to go forward to a life of service, a life of activism, a life of innovation, and a life of leadership. Because the discussion today as we celebrate March the 8th International Women's Day, and as we hold hands with women and men all across our world, we know that leadership, leadership is important. And when your mayor and your city councilors and your municipal representatives are gathered to support a very important celebration on a Sunday that they will open up this very special place to have you come and to have us come and to recognize this as a very special day, International Day for Women. The United Nations with its 193 countries and states, have marked not only March the 8th, but the days before and the days following, a good two to three weeks of celebration, and of asking countries to come in to report on the status of women in their countries. Many of you who um, maybe go back into watching the Promise of Women over the years would know that the very, very first gathering of women from all around the world, a call that went out by the United Nations to its 193 countries and states, and I think it was 1970. Five. The call went out around 1974. I don't think there were 193 countries at the time. I think there were what, 185 or something like that. And when the women gathered in Mexico City in 1985, 1975, sorry, they realized that the situation of, of women around the world was so, in some instances, oppressive, in some instances, not recognized. And many of you would remember that out of that came the call that women did 99% of the work in the home, in the family, in the businesses, and owned 1% of the property. And on and on, the situation of women, there were lists that were compiled of what the situation of women were in different countries and states of the world. And at the end of the conference, as usually happens when the United Nations have these big conferences, there is a commitment as to how we go forward. And the call was, the status of women was so different in different parts of the world. In some places, women could not vote. In some cases, women, uh, the girl child, was not really accepted and appreciated. And looking at this vast list, the uh, call was, we need 10 years. Give us 10 years. We'll go back to our countries and we'll rectify this and we'll come back in 10 years with gender parity. 10 years. 10 years would have brought us to 1985. So the second world conference, women was called in 1985. And we went to Nairobi in Africa. And that conference showed the situation of Palestinian women, the situation 
of women caught in areas of conflict. The situation and uh, of uh, women who were ostracized on several grounds, religion, a whole series of things. And again, another long, long, long list of the disparities between men and women. And at the end of it all, it was a very difficult conference, I was there, very boisterous. And what do you think was said? Give us 10 more years, and we'll fix this 10 more years. So we were in North America, Mexico. We were in Africa, Nairobi. So 10 years, we'll get to Beijing. We'll get to Beijing in 1995. And by the time we report in Beijing, we will have gender parity. We would have equal pay. We would have the situation of promotional opportunities and the situation of women at the top of the, of the list. Instances like glass ceiling and a whole series of, uh, of the things that uh, were considered to be uh, keeping women or holding women back were discussed. And out of that, the big call at the time was, why aren't we fixing this? Because women's rights are human rights. And at the end of the conference, which was really one of the most, I'm not too sure the word is disturbing, but one of the, there were demonstrations, there were um, confusion, there were people not wanting certain governments to speak, there were people who were um, protesting against so many issues. And they could not come to a resolution. And so it was decided, we won't do that 10 year tenure because we are not giving very far because it's almost like an ant's nest. You stir it, you come up with one and, and you don't have the antidote, you don't have the solution. And so we were told, go and fix certain things. And there were some things that were fixable. Reproductive health, what we talk about reproductive health. What we talk about equal pay for work of equal value. How we look at and do research about the percentage of women who are decision makers. And the Canada had a good reporting sheet compared to others. We had come, come back from 1980, 1975, and we had set up status of women's offices in different provinces, municipalities, started to do different things on the ground. And Shaveli mentioned 1974 and some of the early women who were there. We started to look at getting women into the political arena. We started to do several things. And if any of you listened to CBC this morning, you would have heard about the consultation that went on on the status of women and how the number of things that we did in Canada. So when we look at our legislative processes, when we look at the leadership from your, uh, your um, mayor and others, we see that there is leadership and there's a commitment to do a whole series of things to make sure that women in Canada reach that gender parity. We know that we're not there yet. There are lots of things that we need to do. At the same time, we also recognize, as was said over and over, that we need the allies. That women have to have those allies. That men have to understand the importance of gender parity. We've done all kinds of research, and in Canada, one of, I was Minister for the Status of Women, and as I went around into, whether it's UN circles or whatever part,
part of the world, other countries look to us because we were able to do methodologies. We were able to work out equal pay for work of equal value, how you take a chauffeur's job and compare it to a secretarial job and work it out. That we had legislative um, expertise and experience to do difficult uh, things and to, and to share those methodologies with other uh, places in the world that did not have the resources, the legal and otherwise, to make those necessary changes. We also had some difficult things that we had to deal with in Canada. We had people joining us. We had pledged ourselves in the 70s that we were a multicultural, multiracial, multi ethnic, multi religious society. And therefore, we had to ensure that within that whole discussion, the role of women is highlighted. At the same time, we have to recognize and our allies and the men who are in the workplace with us have to recognize the importance of making a way and making room. There are kinds of studies done that have shown that the conversation is different, that better rules are made, better legislation is made when you have voices, different voices in the room. I'm so very proud of this young Z um, club uh, member who spoke a little while ago. Wasn't she a bright, bright young woman? And when we talk about the future of young women, we look to a young woman like herself who understand Many of us, and I speak for uh, those my age group, I'm now 82 years old, and so the whole issue of the way that I was brought up, as they would say in the Caribbean, that you don't speak up and you don't speak out. The young women now understand that it is important for them to hold their place in the society by speaking up and speaking out. And I'm so proud of you, Shalene. And I'm looking for many, many more years with you being in, in city council. And you holding the hand of many other young uh, black women and bringing them around. Because it is those of us who had to push the barriers, who had to break into rooms where it was not polite for you to be in or that it was not polite to discuss certain or to input on certain issues and many of us had to do this and so it's important that those who are coming after us not have to go through the same nonsense that we had to do in earlier days. I was telling the story, uh, Deputy Chief, of when I came to Canada in 1960. Canada was a different place, and Toronto was a different place. We had no charter of rights and freedom. That didn't come till 1982 when we repatriated our constitution and amended it with the charter of rights and freedom. And the section that's important to all of us is that you can't discriminate on the basis of race, creed, religion, sex, nationality. And I was in the house when we added two words, sexual orientation. It wasn't easy for me as a representative, because I had people in Etobicoke Lakeshore who said, if you voted for this gay stuff, we're not going to vote for you. And then I had to call, to call out. How do you expect to be a black woman, a woman of color, to deny rights to other group when I am asking for rights for myself and for other people? And so we take the risk, 
and you take the punch and you take the, the debate that must happen in our society. And so we're all here as women to celebrate. We are here as women on this very special day to see how far we've come at the same time how much is left to be done. There was no landlord and tenant act when I came. So a tenant and landlord can say it's for rent, but not for you. And you had no recourse. We had no human rights commission and code as we know it today. So there was nowhere to go and complain. We had no police community relations. Police was not talking to community, community, and police. Police did their service. And I'll tell you, I've been reading education that when uh, the vocational days, uh, you know, when you go in to see what you want to do as a future, you were ruled out if you were, um, your height and your weight did not measure. So someone, no, 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 you can't even think about policing because you're too small, you're too tall, you're not everything, that. you're not whatever. And it was work and work to make sure that all these things were lifted. And, Kathy, the school boards and the parents were never ever in the same room. 3.30, the door was locked, the kids were sent home, the caretaker locked the gate, he was the keeper of the land, of the, of the estate, and that was it. But we had to work to make sure that we had community schools that we as parents had something to say about the channeling of our kids into various and various programs. And my friends, women were the ones in the, at the front of the line on all of those important issues. It was always the women, it was always the mothers and the grandmothers. And whether it were, were they were new arrivals or whether they were here for generations, it was always women pushing, the women who were saying enough, the women who were saying, I do a full day's work before I arrived at this office this morning. I got up, I made the breakfast, I did the this, I did this thing, and I even put his shoes out, or his suit, or his shirt pressed. We know that there was conversations so now change and have changed. And for us in Canada, we can see the changes. For the young people, they too see the world that they're in and know for them the possibilities are endless. We see at the university and other colleges the percentage of young women who are sitting in classrooms and who are studying and who are graduating and who are looking for their place in the society, whether it's in the area of mathematics or in science or in computer technology, the young women are there and we need to encourage that. And so as we celebrate and we say, okay, we're here, it's 2020, and we appreciate what we have in Canada, and we can come together freely, with free parking, <laughs> and um, participate, participate. We must never forget that there are places in this world today, 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 where women and girls are not experiencing those freedoms that we acknowledge in Canada. And so it's Fashion and Women's Day and we salute women and we celebrate women, but we have to challenge we have to challenge stereotypes. Oh, she used to be said, in Canada we know what stuff now. Right? 
used to be said, I don't think she can do the job. I was driving along uh, some road north, uh, Mississauga, and this great big truck, you know, these ten wheelers um, that you try to drive around and not get too close to. When I looked up, there was a woman in a hitch hand driving the big ten wheeler, twenty wheeler truck. So there is nothing a woman can't do. But there was a time there was no way a woman could walk in and say, I want to drive a truck, or I want to take courses that would lead to my getting qualification for truck driving. We do it now. So we've broken down stereotypes. So we need to continue to break those stereotypes for other places in the world. Fight bias. We need to broaden our perspectives because, again, oftentimes it's the little things that we learned when we were growing up. You know, the boys put out the garbage and the girls make the beds. Those things are now gone. Those were biases that were put in the role of freedom girls. We need to improve situations for young girls. And we need to focus on what this 2020 Each for Equal says. Unity, equality, advocacy. And in many places, we'll place it, I'm sure in the city of Brampton, that you put emphasis on the issue of diversity and inclusion. And as we see organizations working towards a diversity and inclusion, and putting who we are as Canadians, we recognize that not every place in the world have the freedoms we have. They're still living with the biases, with the stereotypes, and with challenges. And so as we celebrate, let's not forget that we've moved ahead, we've made some progress in this society. We're happy that we are where we are today, but we constantly have to remind ourselves. Because I'll tell you, progress that the women have made in various and varied instances sometimes can easily be pulled back, easily be lost with the wrong leadership. And so we, it's important for us to put our names forward, to put ourselves forward, to support women, to support women who know the reason why they are getting themselves into offices and into promotional and uh, other places, that they are supportive of other women and that gender parity, which is called for by the year 2024, will happen, not just for us in Canada, but will happen for all women in the world. So my congratulations to all of you. I thank you so much for the opportunity to say these few words. And uh, best wishes for the rest of the day. And remember International Women's Day. It's not just a day but it's International Women's Day and what it stands for should be every single day. Basically. To help us bring this event to a close, we'd like to be treated to a song by vocalist Amira Khan. Okay, so let's start. A powerful woman. She 
rises from her adversity, but never forgets her origin. She learns from her past and chooses to keep going forward, even when her steps get heavy. She transforms her pain and suffering into strength and wisdom. Yes, she may stumble, and yes, sometimes she falls. But just as the sun always rises, so too does a powerful woman. She is equipped with an intuition that guides her course like a compass. She strives to love herself and all that she stands for with her fierce loyalty, even when it's difficult. She's not afraid to seek truth, even when it hurts. She is passionate and she uses her gift to inspire and spread light and love. With a mind of wonder and a heart of goodness and grit, she is resilient. She refuses to be navigated by fear and doubt. She knows where she is, she knows who she is, and she knows that she needs to be heard. She uplifts other women and embodies authenticity and humility. She loves deeply, lives with compassion, and is relentlessly unapologetic. She is designed to be admired, not always liked. She is fierce, determined, and unstoppable. She is a powerful woman. Thank you. So uh, I also meant to be uh, performing a song for you guys, and I decided to uh, choose the song Superwoman by Alicia Keys. So I'm not sure if we have Alicia Keys fans, but uh, definitely sing along if you if you enjoy the song. Celebrate 
where we have gotten to this point today. At the last celebration that we had during Black History Month, I was able to recognize Charmaine Williams, first black woman to be elected to city council. And that happened in 2018. So take that into consideration. These are modern times, and we are still achieving first. These are not 60, 30, 40 years ago. This is today. Today we are still fighting to have the first Filipino woman elected to a regional council, first black woman, first Indo-Caribbean woman elected to represent us. And that matters, because that shows us that we still have so much more work to do. So much more work to do to ensure that women are given equal opportunities, that we are still receiving the same pay, because even in 2020 today, we are still paid less for the same work. We are still paid less for the same work that a man will do. And so that tells us that regardless of how hard we've been fighting, we still need to continue this fight. It's going to probably take us more than another 10 years, Dr. Augustine. <laughs> But I hope as we usher in a new decade, that in the next 10 years, we can concretely address the inequity that exists in our societies in almost every aspect of society. And to understand that those barriers are different for women. Racialized women experience different barriers. Trans women experience different barriers. It's important to acknowledge that there's still so much work to do to ensure those voices are included. Women with disabilities are still routinely excluded from our communities. And so let's celebrate. Let's take a moment to do that. Absolutely. Because here in this room, we have so many phenomenal women. And I look at the young women in this room, and you give us so much hope. Amina, Rachel, you spoke and shared so passionately. And I want us to take into consideration the importance of the intergenerational knowledge. Dr. Armitage is back there. She's the last serving member of the original chapter. You have so much knowledge to share and impart that it's important for the next generation to value that and to seek out those stories, to understand your struggles so that we can work to overcome them. I think of my grandmothers, my Nanuji and my Nibiji, the first feminists I ever got to know. The first feminist, my maternal grandmother could not read when she came to Canada. She could not even write her own name. But what she valued was the opportunities for her granddaughters to ensure that we had a good education and that we never were limited the way that she was. My maternal grandmother, fierce woman, fierce woman. She came over in the 1970s during the changes to the Immigration Act as a domestic worker. Very similar to your story, Dr. Augustine. And so, even today, women are immigrating to this country and their credentials are not being recognized. They're being forced into precarious, low-paying work. Those are still realities that we need to overcome. So, I think of my grandmothers, I think of the next generation, and I think of all of you in this room. And the work we need to do, but that work is only going to happen if we work together. Collectively, come together with our allies. So many of them are here in this room today. I see Chief Bill Boyd, you know, I know that you're here with us in this march together because we are going to keep demanding better. We're going to demand that we get paid equally for equal work. We're going to demand that you break down those barriers and that our sisters can sit at the same tables and make sure that their voices are heard and that they can shine bright, be who they want to, be as loud as they need to, and be unapologetic for demanding and taking what is rightfully theirs. Because no one should tell you that as a woman, as a young girl, that you can't. In 2020, nobody should tell you that. And if they do, tell them. Just watch them. Right? Because when we show them that we can make that change happen, then we demonstrate the power of women. So on International Women's Day today, I want us to reflect, I want us to celebrate, and I want us to march forward in power together. Because, because the stronger we are united, we will never be divided. Thank you very much, everyone. Happy to Thank you so much uh, to our MPPs, but in particular to MPP Singh for your impassioned and empowering speech.
At this time, I would like to welcome our federal members of parliament to the stage. I know that I saw MP Meninger Sidhu. I believe that MP Sonia Sidhu spotted as well. Changes and what's happening in our board, 
I think that each and every one of you here should not sit still whilst we have black children that have been told they're savages, they're dumb because they're black, that nothing you can do can help them. So I think as a community and as women, we have to ensure that our educational system is serving all boys and girls. I wore this shirt, Save Love, and it's funny when um, uh, MVP Sidhu said, no, sorry, MP Sidhu said about saying it loud. So it's important that women, as women, even though we get stereotyped when you speak up, right, and often you're labeled for speaking up, it's important for, for young people to know that it's important to say it loud. I think of um, Patrick Vincent um, Nye, right, and drinking and driving. I think we need to have that same attitude towards anti-black racism. It should not be tolerated. And one day, it is in my hope that when you see people making racist comments or being or feeling empowered to exercise their bigotry, that we we'll stand up and they will be ostracized. So, um, you know, it's important also for my daughters when they go to school that when other people would say that, oh, from my race is a very progressive race and your race is not so responsible, comments like that will be eradicated from within our education system. So as we celebrate um, Women's Day, I want you to remember the women that are often disenfranchised and not empowered. So happy Women's Day. The rock of a ladder is not to rest upon, but just to hold yourself for some time so that we can put our next foot somewhat higher. We women are marching, we are making changes. We are, you know, making changes in every field, starting from the politics to um, even in the mechanic shops. To be honest, I was so thrilled to see this one girl who said that I want to be a mechanic, and I was like, wow. So women are going up and breaking all the stereotypes. As a South Asian woman, I did that when I started my business as the first uh, person in the mobile dental hygiene industry. When I was told, no, you're not thinking right. I was sent back uh, and I was not given the truck by the mercy sprinter telling them, what are you talking about? If that would have been possible, that would have been done long ago. So I, at that time, I felt like as a woman, I was being treated like that, but then, after a year, I did that. And uh, I was the first one in North America, and broke, I, I broke that barrier that women can do anything, and women can think out of the box. I was on the track set by myself when my cousins were saying that English is not your first language, you're an immigrant, you don't know what it is all about. No, it is about you, your determination, your hard work, and I'm thankful to all the women in my life and my sisters who pushed me to do and to break those barriers and to go forward. So today, again, going back to my quote, women are marching, we are all on that same ladder, but it's our responsibility that we lift each other up. All the young people, all those women of color, or all the other girls in the other countries who are facing all those barriers, lift each other up, empower each other. Together, we can make the history. Thank you. Thank you so much, trustees, and I apologize for my niece and nephew could not be kept away for much longer. And this is going to uh, mark the end of the formal portion of today's event. But before we do that, I would like to ask all of the Brampton title holders, that's all these lovely women and young girls that you see wearing the crowns, to please stand up 
and be acknowledged. I'm going to encourage you all to take out some time and head to the information booths that are around here. You really will find some of these booths to be very engaging and learn something. I hope that you found this event enlightening and inspiring. It has been an absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks to all the presenters and panelists at the workshops here on stage for sharing your stories and your talents with all of us. And a special thank you to Megan Guerra who helped to organize today's event and coordinated much of what you see here today. So big round of applause for her. Thanks to all of you for being here today in celebration of International Women's Day in Brampton. And at this point, before you disperse, we'd like to get a quick aerial picture of everyone. So if everybody could just stand up where they are and turn around.